you for making World News Tonight with David Muir, America's most watched newscast. President Trump on his way to the Winter White House, leaving Washington behind after dropping several political bombs, issuing a number of controversial pardons, using his veto power to force Congress back to town, and threatening the critical relief package so many Americans are depending on. Upping the ante, President Trump pressuring Congress to increase the amount of relief Americans receive, the move forcing the hand of many Republicans who support the president, but also support the bill he's now putting in jeopardy. So what's behind the political gamble? Alarming travel surge, millions of Americans already sidestepping public health recommendations to get together for the holidays, and the new concerns about a more troubling variant of COVID-19 than the one that's canceled Christmas for many in the UK. As we learn, one million people have already been vaccinated so far. Our vaccine watch tonight. And we're with one doctor on the front lines as she receives the vaccine and makes a promise to her patients. I'm going to be more the doctor that I wanted to be, the doctor that I was before this pandemic. The first body camera video from a deadly police shooting, showing the officer turned on his camera after the fatal shots. What we're learning tonight. The holiday weather alert. Dangerous roads as a powerful storm heads east. Blizzard-like conditions for many as we get the Christmas morning forecast. Good evening, I'm Ariel Reshef in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks for streaming with us. We begin tonight with the stimulus, once thought to be a sure thing, but now the president's veto threat has rocked Congress just two days before Christmas. The president wants to raise the amount Americans receive from $600 to $2,000. The political grenade has him at odds with many in his own party and in unlikely agreement with Democrats Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. Staunch conservatives Lindsey Graham and Josh Hawley, also his ally in this effort. ABC's Rachel Scott leads us off with the latest developments and when so many Americans could see that badly needed check. Tonight, with relief for millions in jeopardy and the nation at risk of a government shutdown, President Trump leaving the White House heading to Florida for the holidays. Behind closed doors for days, the president last night posting this message on Twitter, blasting that massive bipartisan stimulus package, demanding Congress increase direct payments from $600 to $2,000. Send me a suitable bill or else the next administration will have to deliver a COVID relief package. Members of his own administration had promised money would be in Americans' pockets before the new year. People are going to see this money the beginning of next week. Even one of the president's closest allies, Senator Lindsey Graham, calling the bill imperfect, but saying the sooner the bill becomes law, the better. Democrats say the president should have weighed in earlier. They didn't get any feedback from the president. People are hurting right now. Also uncertain, federal unemployment benefits and eviction protection set to expire at the end of the year. Lisa Mastretta was waiting for months for Congress to act. She told us that $600 check wouldn't go far, now saying any further delay would be catastrophic. We will have zero income coming into our households because this package is being held up right now. So many waiting on those checks. And Rachel Scott joins me now from Washington. Rachel, what are we hearing from Republican leaders in Congress on how they'll handle the president's latest move? Yeah, well, we know that Democrats are already saying in the House that they're going to try and push this forward with a unanimous consent to try and get those $2,000 checks to the American people. But tonight we are learning that House Republicans do plan to block that. It's unclear which specifically, which House Republican will do that. But make no mistake about it, this will be going directly against the president. But for months now, Democrats have been pushing, trying to get those $2,000 stimulus checks in this bill. Republicans would not budge on the overall price tag which is why you saw that smaller amount of $600, Ariel. A lot of people shell-shocked in Washington tonight. And Rachel, the president leaving Washington today, but not before vetoing the defense spending bill. So what happens next? 
Yeah, so this is really interesting here. The president vetoing this bill. It's something that he's been threatening to veto now for some time. Tonight, he is calling it a gift to both China and Russia. But leaders on both sides of the aisle, Democrats and Republicans, have said that this funding is absolutely vital for the military. So now lawmakers will have to return back to Washington to try and override the president. And if they are successful, this would be the first. It would be the first veto override for the Trump administration, Ariel. Rachel. Scott covering it all in Washington. Thank you so much. Now to the fallout from those presidential pardons. One day after President Trump pardoned or commuted the sentences of 20 people sparking backlash. Let's get to ABC's chief justice correspondent Pierre Thomas. And Pierre, after that backlash, you're also hearing there could be more pardons on the way. Ariel, we're expecting the pardoning spree to continue a day after President Trump granted clemency to two people who lied to investigators in the Russia investigation, including former campaign aide George Papadopoulos. Our expectation is that the president may try to purge the prosecution legacy of special counsel Bob Mueller. Some names possibly being considered for pardons include Roger Stone, who sentenced the president already commuted after he was convicted of witness tampering lying to Congress about the Russia probe, and Paul Manafort, his former campaign chairman, who was convicted of bank and tax fraud. Ariel? Pierre, thank you so much. Pleasure. And among the president's pardons, those four former Blackwater security guards convicted of gunning down 14 Iraqi civilians in 2007 while guarding an American diplomatic convoy. For more context on this, our Maggie Rooley joins us from London. And Maggie, this move is now sparking outrage overseas. Hey, Ariel, we are seeing so much outrage over this. Uh, to bring you back to exactly why people are so frustrated, uh, this was an absolutely horrific shooting that happened back in 2007 when these four men were in Iraq working for Blackwater, a private security company that has been hired by the U.S. government. Now, while there, they opened fire on an unarmed crowd in a square in Baghdad. They killed 17 people, including two children. They left 20 others injured. Just a, a horrible, tragic, tragic event. Now, all four of those men area were convicted and initially sentenced to 30 years in prison. Now, after these pardons today, the men's lawyers are applauding them. They say all along the four men have said they were just returning fire and that they're innocent. But Ariel, for the families of those 17 people who were killed, the others who were injured, they say they're outraged. The outrage is an understatement. These pardons have broken their hearts. Now, Muhammad Kanani's nine-year-old son, Ali, was murdered that day. ABC News spoke to him, and he told us that this pardon is like losing his son all over again. He feels like it's a betrayal to the U.S. justice system and that even more than that, he tells us he feels like it's left the window open for others to act with impunity in the future. Now, many of the families that we spoke with here at ABC told us that they plan to go to the streets to protest these pardons. But Ariel, it's not only the families that are outraged. Many organizations are now speaking out. The ACLU uh, called the president's pardons a disgraceful new low. The U.N. Human Rights Office said they're deeply concerned that these pardons will embolden others to commit similar crimes in the future. Uh, so clearly this is something that's not only impacting the families in Iraq, this is being felt around the world tonight, Ariel. Yeah, global reverberations there, Maggie. Mm -hmm. And turning back to the pandemic, you're in London, where as many are saying now, Christmas has been canceled due to this new variant of COVID-19. But now we're learning of a potentially more alarming mutation in South Africa. Yeah, exactly. This is not what we want to hear just days before Christmas. Like you said, we're already dealing with that other mutated variation, the virus that was announced earlier this week through uh, most of England into a strict lockdown. Uh, but now we're learning of a new variant that's said to be even more contagious than that other variant that was also more contagious. So again, very, very concerning. Now, the UK government says uh, they discovered this variant. They, they think it originated in South Africa. That's a country that's seen a huge spike in cases in recent weeks. And well, the UK government has confirmed that this is a mutation and that there are at least two cases confirmed in the UK, at least. Now, these viruses, we should note, Ariel, they're, they're constantly mutating. So there are many other variations already out there. And so far, there is no evidence that this one is more deadly or that it will affect the vaccine. So that, that is the good news. We don't know yet, but still a lot more research has to be done to figure out the, the severity of how contagious is this new virus? Will it affect things down the road? Uh, so again, it is worrying enough uh, that many countries like the UK are now banning travel from South Africa and telling anyone that's been in contact with someone from South Africa should quarantine immediately. Again, Ariel, not what we need to hear just days before Christmas. Not at all. And scientists will be looking into this. Maggie, thank you for staying up late with us. We appreciate it.
As concerns grow around the globe about potential mutations of COVID-19, the reality here at home is grim. Millions are expected to defy warnings to stay home, despite the fact that more than 3,000 people lost their lives in just the last 24 hours. Will we see a surge on top of a surge on top of a surge? A question so many are asking. Public health officials are fearing this. And can our own medical system handle it? Stephanie Ramos has more. Despite dire warnings, nearly 85 million Americans are expected to travel for Christmas, sparking fears of another catastrophic coronavirus surge, worse than what we saw after Thanksgiving. Our Gio Benitez is at New York's LaGuardia Airport. TSA screening more than 5 million people since Friday, a record during the pandemic, and they're going mostly to rural areas, not big cities, raising concerns about a possible surge in vulnerable communities. And tonight, that alarming new headline out of the UK about yet another variant of the virus. Officials identifying two people in the UK infected with a variant known to be circulating in South Africa just days after announcing a different version is spreading rapidly in the UK. This new variant is highly concerning because it is yet more transmissible and it appears to have mutated further than the new variant that's been discovered in the UK. Experts urging caution, saying it's common for viruses to mutate, but officials now investigating exactly how and why the UK variant is spreading more easily amongst children and adults. New York City taking action, ordering all travelers from the UK to quarantine or face daily fines of $1,000. We are gonna have sheriff's deputies go to the home or the hotel of every single traveler coming in from the UK. Scientists say the variant is likely already in the US, but believe the newly authorized Moderna and Pfizer vaccines will work against it. And today, Pfizer announcing a deal with the US government, providing 100 million more doses of its vaccine by next July, doubling the initial amount. The CDC saying more than a million Americans have been vaccinated. <laughs> Today, those brave FDNY paramedics who responded to countless calls during the brutal spring surge receiving their first shots on the same day they learned a 12th member died. We've been on the front line of this terrible and very contagious virus. We have lost people uh, along the way, and today is the first day that we start saving the lives of the first responders. December on track to be the deadliest month of the pandemic. More than 3,400 lives lost on Tuesday. The Cheatham family in Kentucky losing three family members since Thanksgiving. First their grandfather, then both their parents. I could have went one Christmas without seeing my parents. And now we get to spend the rest of our lives without ours. Certainly a poignant reminder there. Stephanie Ramos joins us now from New York. And Stephanie, public health officials, of course, are recommending no holiday travel. But if you do have to go somewhere, what are some ways to keep your risk down? So the CDC says that the lowest risk travel are short trips by car and with members of your own household. And don't make stops along the way. This way you can avoid other people and contaminated surfaces. Some good advice there. And Stephanie, as you mentioned, the CDC released the number of Americans vaccinated so far. How many doses of the two vaccines have been distributed? Ariel, the U.S. has really reached a milestone today. The CDC says that more than a million people have received the first dose of the COVID-19 vaccine since the administration began 10 days ago. And they also say that about 9.4 million doses have been delivered to hospitals and other locations with many more to go. Ariel. So many waiting in line to get that vaccine. Stephanie Ramos, thank you so much tonight. Yeah. And turning now to the brave firefighters and EMTs on the front lines of the pandemic, specifically the epicenter of Southern California, the first responders risking their lives every day. Our Kaylee Hartung along for the ride with them as the COVID calls keep coming in. Tonight, this is the battle on the front lines. Paramedics in Orange County responding to a relentless surge. This man has apparent COVID symptoms and is being taken to the hospital for testing. His family's on high alert, another relative in critical condition. The last couple of weeks have been some of the things we've never seen before. Call volume, uh, just the number of uh, uh, acutely ill patients. In just a half hour during our ride along, six potential COVID 911 calls coming in. It's a scene playing out across the country. More than 117,000 Americans are now in the hospital, a new record. Captain Lee Cabrera and his crew 
waiting up to an hour with patients because there's no room. Having a critically ill person in your care in the back of the ambulance and being unable to get into the hospital is definitely challenging and concerning. Here in Orange County, 5% of firefighters are sidelined. The department pushed to the brink. Right now, it's like all rules are out the window. We just need to get keep keep guys and gals uh, on our rigs and responding to, you know, to calls and helping out the citizens. Because those calls are going to keep coming. They're not stopping. Those calls not stopping. Kaylee Hartung joins us now. And Kaylee, what are the latest numbers coming out of California? Hey, Ariel, these latest numbers, they really reflect the stress that these firefighters are under. This state has just surpassed 2 million cases and half of those cases came in just the last six weeks. So that's how you put a surge upon a surge in perspective. It's certainly alarming numbers there. And Kaylee, you yourself, as we know, recovered from COVID-19 early in the pandemic. We've seen you embed with frontline workers before, but not during a surge like this one. Does this feel different to you? It, it does feel different, and these firefighters will tell you it feels different to them, too. Uh, really, the story of our day, Ariel, we started out at Station 48. You'll notice we're at Station 66 right now. But when we got to Station 48 this morning, we were told we couldn't come in. One of their own, one of their firefighter paramedics woke up last night with, with COVID-like symptoms, and they, they expected that he will test positive today. And that means that entire station needs to be deconned. That means everyone he's come into contact with uh, could be put into quarantine. And then we were transferred over here to Station 66, just across just across Orange County. But that's what these guys, these men and women are dealing with right now. Their own are getting sick. Right now, about 5% of the Orange County uh, Fire Authority are sidelined because they too are being exposed to this virus and they're not strong enough to fight it either. Um, this also feels different because of that, the severity of the illness that, that these firefighter paramedics say that they continue to encounter. They tell me a, a couple months ago when, when things felt like they were getting back to normal, they might get five calls a day. Now they're getting 20. It's just, it's a different world and things continue to get worse. And whether you're talking to these guys or doctors in the hospital where we were yesterday, everyone tells you they expect this to get worse. Ariel. COVID-19 knows no bounds, not even for our bravest. Kaylee, on the story from the very beginning, we appreciate it. And next to that massive storm, our weather teams have been tracking all week. More than 150 million under weather alerts right now. Already wide out and dangerous driving conditions in Minnesota. The storm is continuing to march east and it could cause flooding and power outages on Christmas Day along the east coast. Senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all for us. Rob, what's the latest? Well, this this is a dynamic storm and has been since it hit the, the northwest coast of Ariel, and it's only deepening and expanding now uh, near the Great Lakes. We had winds uh, measured over 60 miles per hour in Minnesota, and now Minneapolis is in the throes of a blizzard warning. That's rare for even, even Minneapolis. So we've got blizzard warnings across that part of the country, and we've got high wind watches and warnings from Texas all the way to the northeast, where we also have flood watches. So uh, all sorts of uh, impacts coming with this. Let's uh, time out the front. Itself. I think the, the snow and the blowing snow goes away by tomorrow morning as this low kind of lifts up and becomes more of a rainmaker from the Great Lakes down to the Gulf Coast. I'm really concerned about the Carolinas uh, for the Virginia coast. We could not only see severe thunderstorms, but the potential there for seeing uh, tornadoes as well. So dangerous um, driving tomorrow, if not, you know, certainly difficult driving tomorrow, whether you're on the ground or in the air or if you're, you're Santa in a sleigh. Look at that tomorrow night around midnight. I mean, it's going to be windy. It's going to be uh, cold behind the system. Damaging winds potentially. D.C., Philly, New York into Boston might see some power outages come come uh, Friday morning. Thursday, tomorrow morning, it's low temperatures. Look at this. Widespread below freezing wind chills in that snow zone. That is uh, that is frightening stuff. Even Dallas getting in to, to below freezing. And then uh, as we get to, to Christmas morning, that cold air pours to the east and gets all the way down into Florida, where they have uh, actually talked about the potential for seeing iguanas falling out of trees which actually does happen is a thing across uh, central Florida, and that could very well happen on Christmas Day. So there you have it. Uh, there's going to be some people, uh, Ariel, that, that will wake up Christmas morning that don't have power. So that's not the best Christmas gift, certainly. Um, but uh, this, is, this, is, this is the way Mother Nature works, and it looks, looks like a pretty bad storm coming through here. It'll all be done the day uh, for Boxing Day as they celebrate in Canada on the 26th. We will wait for that. Hopefully everyone, including you, stay safe out there. Rob, thanks. Thank you, too. When we come back, the high-rise blast leaving workers stranded several stories up and the critical injuries we're learning about tonight. 
With the massive vaccination process underway in tonight's Vaccine Watch, we examine how the effort to immunize is being carried out in nursing homes. But up next, the new body camera video showing the moments after the fatal shooting of an unarmed black man in Columbus, Ohio, who police say approached them with a cell phone in his hand. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change, well, like every day. So what is it that you really need to know, want to know, to help you not just get through your day, but make the most of it? Feel smarter, feel better, feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA3, what you need to know. It's all about you. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. This is going to be so good. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. What you're seeing right now, this is part of the eye wall. This procession of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. To the right, guys. So this is the fourth week end of protest. <laughs> Watch NBC News on location for Facebook Watch. Your mom said, comb your hair. Your dad told you, smart up. Your dog is judging you right now. And your best friend just called you crazy. We all need someone who'll pull no punches and give it to us straight. Now imagine getting your news like that. No bull, no spin, just give it to me straight. Straightforward news straight to the heart of the story. ABC News, straightforward. What's the most innovative daily news podcast out there to listen to every day? Well, the Edward R. Murrow Awards say it's Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. Even the New York Times calls us a top news podcast worth listening to. So if you like getting behind the biggest news stories of the day, inside all the details, the backstory, and what will happen next, then listen to Start Here, the daily news podcast from ABC News. It's like no other news podcast out there. Even the critics agree. Listen free on Apple Podcasts. We're back now with the new police body camera video and the deadly shooting of Andrew Maurice Hill, an unarmed black man who Columbus police say approached officers with a cell phone in his hand. That new video emerging on the same day as the funeral for Casey Goodson, a black man shot and killed by a deputy two weeks ago. Our Marcus Moore reports. This is newly released video from a Columbus police officer's body camera showing moments after 47-year-old Andre Hill was shot. Put your hands out to the side. According to authorities, the officers responded to a disturbance call early Tuesday morning. So the gray SUV in front of this location keeps starting up and running. Authorities say Officer Adam Coy, a 19-year veteran of the force, and another officer arrived to an open garage door with Hill inside. Hill walking towards the officers with a phone in one hand and the other hand not visible. Officer Coy opened fire, shooting Hill, who authorities say was unarmed. To see him lying in the driveway, minute after minute after minute after minute with no attempt to render aid. That is a stunning disregard for life. And in this case, black life. Hill would later die at the hospital. The officers involved not activating their body cameras until immediately after the shooting. Investigators will be examining the crucial moments captured by the camera's look back feature, which pre-records 60 seconds of video from the moment it turns on. But it does not capture audio, so it is unclear what was said between Hill and the two officers. Marcus Moore joins us now. And Marcus, Columbus's mayor has had some harsh words for that officer involved in this, so what's next for the officer? Well, that's right, Ariel. He said uh, that he wants the officer to be 
terminated uh, immediately. And right now we know that Officer Coy, who again is a 19-year veteran of the force, has been placed on administrative leave as this investigation unfolds. And Marcus, this is the second deadly police shooting in recent weeks for Columbus police. Yeah, it's been a very difficult time. Even the mayor acknowledged how exhausted the community is. Uh, this comes just weeks after another man, Casey Goodson Jr., was uh, shot and killed by police officers uh, in the first part of December, and he was actually laid to rest today uh, in Columbus, uh, an emotional day for, uh, for, for the family indeed. Marcus Moore, thank you so much. Still ahead here on Prime, concerned your gift might not make it in time for Christmas? We have some tips. And the NBA star under investigation for doing something that could have put him and his teammates at risk of catching COVID. And we keep hearing those concerns about a Christmas surge. We examine the data after the Thanksgiving holiday by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. Harry and Meghan and Archie sharing their holiday card with the world. This is what being live is all about. This is ABC News Live, the 24-7 streaming news source, ABC News. Breaking news, live events as they happen, streaming live, non-stop, straight to you. Original, on the edge, breakthrough storytelling from ABC News, National Geographic, ESPN, all designed differently for you to stream straight to any screen whenever you want, free. And imagine the most celebrated, epic live events and moments all playing out right before your eyes. See those flames behind me? And go deeper inside the groundbreaking exclusives from the campaign trail only ABC News gets. Watch ABC News Live right now and anytime. Streaming on Roku, Hulu, Facebook, and ABCNews.com. ABC News Live. Streaming everywhere right to you. ABC News Live. The Americans here on the ground and the Iraqis. 18,000 tons. Matatas. Ismail. David. David. see just home after home. David, thanks for meeting us. This was your view. My favorite view. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, mornings may look different these days, but where you start your day, where you spend your mornings, where you get connected to everything that's happening. And face it, there's a whole lot happening in our world these days. Where you get all the breaking new information of the day to help you navigate through these times. That's why we're here. Good morning, sunshine. And making sure you start your day off with a smile and some sunshine. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Good morning, America. Oh, how I love saying that. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. As millions of Americans travel for the Christmas holiday amid the pandemic, we have some sobering new data on the potential impact of travel on the spread of the virus after Thanksgiving. Let's take a look by the numbers. An ABC News investigation looking at travel from 20 of the nation's largest counties shows a dramatic spike in COVID infections in the week after significant Thanksgiving travel. Overall, 18 of those counties saw increases following Thanksgiving, where many may have gathered with family and friends. In the counties with the highest numbers of people People who traveled more than 500 miles, there was an average of an additional 407 infections per day, a 36% jump. In Los Angeles County, the number of COVID-19 cases per day grew 79.5% in the week after Thanksgiving. Dallas County, Texas saw a 61% increase after Thanksgiving, going from 924 new daily cases to nearly 1,500. 
Nationally, since late November, the seven-day average of new cases has increased by 32 percent, with 12 days this month so far recording a daily caseload of over 200,000. And with 5 million people passing through TSA checkpoints in the last five days, experts say those case numbers are likely to get worse following December holiday travel. And we still have a ton to get to right here on Prime. The real-life Christmas battle taking place in one town over across. It's one of the world's most profitable businesses, yet it's illegal. Our look into the underground cocaine trafficking industry. As doctors continue to get vaccinated, one of them on the front lines is sharing her experiences with us. But first, a look at our top trending stories on ABCnews.com. Finish this sentence. 2020 has been... Oh. <sighs> now, Tuesday night on ABC. Just wait until you see the answers. 2020 is over? Wow. Tuesday night on ABC. He's faced world leaders, but now Tuesday, this might be his greatest challenge. Your move, George. The 10-year-old chess prodigy, George, the match. You ready for my gambit? Who will win? Bring it on, George. Tuesday <laughs> on ABC. Good morning, America. Checkmate. We're following breaking news right now. For the second time in two days, President Trump has issued a number of presidential pardons, including for his political allies. Just now, the president pardoned 26 people, including Roger Stone and Paul Manafort. He also commuted the sentences of three people. Stone had his prison sentence commuted in July, days before he was scheduled to report to a federal prison for seven counts of obstructing justice, witness tampering, and multiple counts of lying to Congress in the Mueller investigation. Trump's full pardon nullifies Stone's now conviction entirely, and Manafort, the former Trump 2016 campaign chairman, was found guilty of multiple counts of tax and bank fraud related to activity from before he joined the campaign. He was sentenced to seven years, but was released to home confinement in the early in, in early 2020, I should say, due to uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic. Our chief justice correspondent Pierre Thomas joins us now. And Pierre, with the pardons of Stone and Manafort, Trump is clearly trying to nullify in his own way the Mueller investigation or just make it disappear. He's trying to purge the legacy of Bob Mueller and these prosecutions. If you look at Roger Stone, one of the biggest names, uh, loyal ally, Paul Manafort, the campaign chairman. Yesterday, a key aide during the campaign, George Papadopoulos, his case pardoned. Also, an attorney associated. And then a few weeks earlier, you had Michael Flynn, uh, the former national security advisor. His case was pardoned as well. So the president is clearly trying to make clear he believes that the investigation was a hoax. And even though these people lied and in some cases uh, pled guilty or were clearly convicted, the president's trying to make it all go away, Ariel. Yeah, Pierre, thank you. And let's bring in senior editorial producer John Santucci. And John, also among those pardoned today, Charles Kushner, the father of Trump's son-in-law, Jared Kushner. Yeah, this is one that uh, many folks had expected would come uh, January 2017, as soon as Donald Trump took the oath of office. Uh, but it took four years for Jared Kushner uh, to get that presidential pardon for his father, Charlie Kushner. Uh, this is a case, Ariel, that goes back to 2005. It relates to tax evasion fraud. Uh, also, a scheme setting up uh, Kushner's uh, brother-in-law um, in, in an awful coup involving some family drama. Um, but he, of course, served his prison time, has been out and resumed uh, control of the Kushner company, uh, which Jared Kushner was running up until the point that he joined President Trump's campaign and ultimately entered the White House in 2017. Uh, we can also expect that President Trump is going to have more pardons in the coming weeks. Our sources tell ABC News that we do not believe more pardons will come from now until the end of the year, but as everyone cautions. You never know with Donald Trump. But going into the beginning of 2021, Donald Trump has 20 days left in office. And we know from our sources that this pardon list is massive. Calls have been coming into the White House for weeks. Vetting is underway. And as Pierre mentioned, Ariel, there could be other individuals tied to Robert Mueller's investigation and key allies of President Trump that could get a pardon before his time is up in office.
And John, I know you will keep tracking it for us, and we can't forget the context of all of this after several landmines from the president, the stimulus, and now this. So we will keep an eye on it. Turning now to developments in Baltimore tonight, several people are in critical condition after a high-rise explosion caused a partial roof collapse. The incident left workers stranded in scaffolding several stories up. Our Trevor Alt has more. Tonight, stunning images and a daring rescue after a massive explosion rocks downtown Baltimore. Two men were taking off scaffolding. Two men who'd been cleaning windows, helplessly dangling on scaffolding this morning, 10 stories up the side of the Baltimore Electric and Gas Company offices. The force of the blast knocking a second scaffold off the building. Baltimore's elite special operations team performing a highly technical rescue. One of our members had to step out on the scaffold, climb up the scaffold, and actually cut through the window in the 11th floor and bring him through the 11th floor. With part of the roof collapsing, firefighters clearing the high rise floor by floor and evacuating two neighboring buildings. In total, 21 people taken to the hospital, nine of them now in critical condition. The cause of the explosion is under investigation, but the company says construction on the air and boiler system is likely to blame. Thankfully, because of the pandemic and the holiday, this building was mostly empty. Otherwise, this could have been a lot worse. Ariel. Trevor, thank you. The arrival of COVID-19 vaccines can't come soon enough for our nation's elderly, especially those in nursing homes and long-term care facilities who have suffered tremendous losses through the pandemic. So we were there as the first doses of vaccines rolled out in the past week to those facilities. Bob Woodruff tracking it all in this week's Vaccine Watch. Last week, the shots heard around the world. Over the past few weeks, we watched as frontline health care workers received the protection they've needed since March. And CVS and Walgreens vaccinated some of the first nursing home residents in the U.S. against COVID-19. We'll be working with the CVS pharmacy. I'm looking forward to it. I, you know, have one more chance to go out and bug my kids a little longer. For those in long-term care and nursing home facilities, the excitement is palpable. The loneliness of the past 10 months taking its toll. Hi, Dad. How are you? How are you? I love you. With vaccine rollouts underway, America's largest pharmacies are stepping up, administering doses to the country's most vulnerable populations. ABC's Janae Norman got an exclusive look at how companies like CVS are deploying and administering the vaccine to nursing homes. This box comes directly from Pfizer. They'll open it up, press a button as sort of a high-tech way to say, hey, we've received the package. They'll take out a tray of vials that they need, and they're going to put it in a refrigerator down here where it'll thaw for at least three hours. So they'll put it in there where it can stay up to five days until the vaccine's about 35, 40 degrees. They'll leave it there and then put it in these temperature regulated bags. One of these vials is reserved for 95-year-old Jean Peters. I feel fine. It am good, but I am a little taken back by all this excitement. But before the dose goes into Jean's arm, CVS personnel puts the temperature-controlled bags into their own vehicles. From here, the clock starts ticking. There's only a few hours before the vaccine is no longer usable, and these transporters have apps to help keep them on track. If we click this, we have an direct access to the CVS call command center and if it's an extreme emergency we have access to call 911. Just yesterday 49 year old Julian Holland was vaccinated in Ohio. He's been recovering from a back injury as a long-term care facility for the past few months. I'm Shayla. I'm an intern at CVS and I will be giving you your first dose. Okay. You ready? I'm ready. Easy peasy. Thank awesome. you. That yep, was you're nice. All set. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I'll see you again in a couple weeks. CVS and Walgreens say it'll take only a month to get the first doses of the vaccine to all of the nursing homes who have asked for it. Moderna vaccine can be shipped and stored at standard freezer temperatures and is packed in containers of 100 doses each. This allows jurisdictions the flexibility to support hard to reach small and more rural areas. Areas like in Lynn Pixler's Indiana. She says CVS plans to visit her facility in January. I doubt if it's going to happen for Christmas, but it's going to be one heck of a Valentine's. This is Bob Woodruff tracking the race for a vaccine. 
Our thanks to Bob for that important reporting. Of course, frontline medical workers in our nation's hospitals were the first to receive the vaccine, with doctors and nurses working around the clock getting that much-needed defense. Back in April, we introduced you to Dr. Daniela Lamas, a critical care physician at Boston's Brigham and Will Will Brigham and Women's Hospital, who's been treating COVID patients since the pandemic began. So this week, we checked in with her as she received the vaccine to get her reflections on this moment in the pandemic and her message to the country as we face a very difficult winter ahead. Here she is in her own words. My name is Daniela Lamas, and I'm a pulmonary and critical care doctor here in Boston at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Been caring for patients, many with COVID-19 in our intensive care units, uh, since the spring surge back in March. And I was fortunate to receive the first shot of the COVID vaccine a couple of days ago. It didn't hurt at all, and I felt no negative consequence from it. In truth, all I felt was soreness on my left upper arm, which was very similar to what I would feel after a flu shot, sort of like I'd been lifting weights. And to be honest, I kind of like that soreness. I like the fact that I can still touch it and remember, oh, here it is. I got the vaccine. You know, walking through the hospital right now, it's been, it's been pretty weighty and sad for the past months. Uh, the summer was this weird time of limbo, and now in the fall, we've seen the COVID numbers grow. But with the vaccine in the past couple of days, there has been uh, an adrenaline, an energy, a worry about signing up, and then really a hope and a hope that things will be different, that this is sort of the miracle of science that is being brought to us and that will in time be brought to the rest of the country. Welcome to history. So we get our vaccines and we feel that hope and that adrenaline, but we also feel worried because we know what's going on right upstairs. And that is the strange limbo that we're in right now and that we're trying to balance. It's balanced with the fact that we're in the midst of a winter surge here, that throughout the country, hospitals are overcrowded. My own hospital is overcrowded. Here in Massachusetts, elective surgeries have been put on hold once again. Here in my hospital, our visitor restrictions are as stringent as they have been since the spring. And so that hope is counterbalanced by the fact that there is an increasing number of people who are in our intensive care units who are sick, who might die, often after an indoor family event, a gathering, a Thanksgiving. So we're in a dark time. It's winter, the days are short, the nights are long, and we are all so tired. I take care of patients and I realize that perhaps the physical exam I'm doing the procedures that we do are the first physical contact they have felt from someone else since the spring. We are deeply exhausted of being alone, of being isolated, particularly older people who live alone. This has been devastating. And people, people want to give up. They want to say, let me just have that dinner with family. Let me just be with others. And the vaccine is something that says these photos of doctors getting the vaccine, of nurses getting the vaccine, they say, hold on. They say there is a reason to hold on because there is an endpoint. And if you can endure, you too will get this vaccine and we will be able to re-enter a world that sure won't look just like the world of 2019 that we left, but will look better than this one. I get my second shot on January 9th. And after that, I will be as fully protected as somebody can be. Of course, until then and far after, I will continue to wear masks I will continue to distance. I'll continue to take all of the precautions I've taken before the vaccine. But I think that in the hospital, things will be different. And I can promise this to my patients, to patients who won't have access to the vaccine for months to come. I'm gonna be more the doctor that I wanted to be, the doctor that I was before this pandemic. Currently, when I hear a patient cough and I'm in the room, my body tenses up and the patient clocks it, I know that. I hope, I don't know how long it'll take, but I hope that my body calms, that I'm able to tell myself, you can stay in here, you can be protected. And I know that there is a point to holding on, to enduring, because we will get through this. There is now a light at the end of this tunnel, even though it is far away and even though there is so much loss to come. And if you look at these vaccine selfies, take them as hope, take them as a promise. And as the promise I am giving as a doctor, that I'm gonna be a better doctor, I'm going to make sure that I do whatever I can to keep my patients safe so that they too can get to the point where they are able to smile for that photo and where they're able to say, I made it. 
Our thanks to Dr. Lamas for the work she is doing and for sharing her story with us. Overseas now to a rather interesting way for traffickers to smuggle drugs. And no, we're not talking about the vaccine. Police in Turkey uncovered two and a half kilos of cocaine tucked behind portraits of the recently deceased Argentine soccer legend Diego Maradona. A 72-year-old German man was arrested at the Istanbul airport in connection with the discovery. Maradona died last month and had a long history of cocaine abuse, but just released autopsy re reports reveal that Maradona did not have any drugs in his system at the time of his death. And with the underground world of cocaine trafficking clearly booming around the globe, Mariana Van Zeller and our partners at Nat Geo give us a closer look. So we're driving for an hour uh, up the mountain in these dirt roads. We're heading to meet the dueño, the owner of a drug operation who's given us a green light to film his uh, lab in the jungle. All I know is that I've been promised to see the place where cocaine begins its 3,000 mile journey to the US. But for now, everyone is just nervous about getting there. We've been told that every time a car approaches or we go through these towns that have lights, that we should hide our faces because they don't want to see you know, any gringos in this area because it would raise suspicions. This area is quite dangerous. Even though we've gotten permission to see this cocaine lab, to get there, we have to pass through land controlled by other clans and militias who have no idea who we are or what we're up to. So I'm a little startled when in the middle of a deserted road, a man suddenly appears out of the darkness. I'm trying to figure out who this guy is. Entonces, ¿tú vas, vas con nosotros? Ah, OK. ¿Y tú trabajas ahí o cuál es tu papel? Perdón. The chemist, the key figure in the whole operation, was standing on a mountain road in the pitch dark. Sometimes you can't make this stuff up. So they're checking the area to make sure that everything is safe. OK, shut off all lights. And here it is the entry into the jungle. This is my stupid, and this one not even knew that I was a good one. In Cadopel, the summoned for the consul passa, and all the people who are in the city, they are not even in the city. He's saying that the town close by, if they see us, they can create problems to all of us. Town close by, if they see us, they can create problems to all of us. These labs are the economic engines for the local communities. Without them, there would be little demand for coca leaves. That's why villagers are so protective. We're basically a threat to their livelihood. The chemist has made me promise that I won't reveal the location. I told him it's not a problem. I can barely see my own feet. I can't see. I can't see. Intrepid reporting there. Our thanks to Mariana. And be sure to catch the latest episode of Trafficked Wednesdays at 9, 8 central on National Geographic. Next to the American teen behind bars in the Cayman Islands for breaking that nation's COVID quarantine rules. Her mother is speaking out in an emotional interview. Victor Okendo has more. American Skyler Mack learning she'll spend the next two months in a Caribbean jail. Mack's mother and stepfather speaking out for the first time since their daughter's arrest for violating COVID-19 protocols in the Cayman Islands, telling ABC affiliate WSB they're living through their worst nightmare. She's scared to death over there. She's by herself. There's no family there whatsoever. They can see her. The 18-year-old pre-med student was silent as she was escorted inside that courtroom, her hands cuffed. Mac and her boyfriend, Vanjay Ramgeet, asking the nation's high court for leniency, ultimately getting their prison sentence cut down from four months to two. Her parents got a call from Skyler just after the ruling came in. This devastated her. She was hoping she would get to be home sooner. She's going to spend Christmas alone by herself. 
Mack traveled to the Caribbean island on November 27th and according to officials, broke her mandatory 14-day quarantine after just two days and one negative COVID test. She allegedly removed her wrist monitor and left quarantine to watch her boyfriend, a 24-year-old professional jet ski racer, compete. The trip to paradise taking a quick turn once authorities learned that Mack attended the competition. Both Mack and Ramgeet were detained, Ramgeet charged with aiding and abetting. Their punishment, seesawing. Initially ordered to pay a fine and serve community service, then upped to four months in prison before the final decision Tuesday, two months. I still remember her saying that, you know, she simply can't do this, she can't go back to prison. The couple's attorney saying they accept the court's decision and continue to express remorse for their actions. We're not exploring any further avenues of appeal. Skyler's mother vowing to keep fighting until her daughter is back in the U.S. Of course, we're hoping for a different outcome. Um, I mean, we're not going to stop. We're going to keep fighting until she's here home with us safe. Our thanks to Victor for that report. And when we come back, still waiting for your Christmas gifts to arrive? Well, if so, you might be in trouble, but we have a few tips to keep you off of Santa's naughty list. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. Most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. I know what happened, and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. This is all about magic and wonder. That's what it's all about. Christmas in the trenches. Prepare to have your little doggy mind blown. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. What you're seeing right now, this is part of the eye wall. This procession of migrants goes back two miles. There is going to be catastrophic damage. This fire has made a run. You can see those flames shooting up into the sky. We are on the jam-packed red carpet. To the right, guys. So this is the fourth week end of protest. <laughs> Watch NBC News on location for Facebook Watch. Breaking news, context, analysis. With today's extraordinary news cycle. Now is the perfect time for ABC News Live. A streaming news game changer. The time is now for ABC News Live. Get it, streaming everywhere. He's faced world leaders, but now Tuesday, this might be his greatest challenge. Your move, George. The 10-year-old chess prodigy, George, the match. You ready for my gambit? Who will win? Bring it on, George. Tuesday on ABC. <laughs> Good morning, America. Checkmate. It's a Christmas miracle when a battle with cancer left this couple unable to carry a child. A former high school classmate who is now a nurse fighting COVID stepped up to give the ultimate gift. See the emotional celebration and one very happy ending tomorrow on GMA. Tonight, the president's pardon spree continues. 
Trump granting a full pardon to self-proclaimed dirty trickster Roger Stone, one of his most loyal allies. Also receiving a pardon tonight, the president's former campaign manager, Paul Manafort, who received the toughest sentence of any of Trump's associates entangled in the Mueller investigation. The president already granted clemency to others charged in connection with the Mueller probe, pardoning Michael Flynn, his former national security advisor. George Papadopoulos and an attorney charged early in the investigation. Tonight, Trump also pardoning someone close to his family, the father of his son-in-law, Jared Kushner. Financial relief for millions of Americans is on hold after the president announced he won't sign the COVID-19 relief package. Send me a suitable bill or else the next administration will have to deliver a COVID relief package. So the Trump administration not only indicated that the president would be signing this bill, they said that those checks would go out as soon as next week. I think that we definitely need to get relief. And I mean, the challenge was, as even the speaker said, they didn't get any feedback from the president. I know that Democrats certainly wanted to get more relief than the $600. With the two deadliest days of the pandemic occurring in the past week, the soaring death toll leaving many Americans grieving for their loved ones during this holiday season. Every person that we hear that dies, that's not just a number, it is a person. A real life Christmas battle brewing over decorations in a North Carolina town. James and Dee Faison fighting back after their local homeowners association in Raleigh demanded they take down one of their most personal possessions, a cross. Then we received a letter saying that our cross was not representative of, of Christmas. The couple threatened with a $100 fine and told in a letter, quote, unless biblical references can be provided noting the cross as a symbol of the Christmas season, the cross is not considered a Christmas decoration. Who's ever heard of a HOA asking their, their residents um, to, to provide biblical references for why you have the cross up for Christmas? The board eventually backing down, but the Faisons say that only happened once local media got involved. Now the couple's lawyer says they're planning to file a lawsuit in federal court. NBA superstar James Harden is coming under fire tonight after he was allegedly seen in a video at a large club Christmas party. The Houston Rockets player responded to the allegations in his now deleted Instagram story, denying the event was held at a strip club and he was there to show support for his homegirl. The NBA is investigating for potential violations of his COVID safety protocols. The Rockets today also sent home a group of players after a separate Rockets player tested positive for COVID-19. They say this was unrelated to the Harden investigation. The Rockets' Thunder game tonight has now been postponed. Donner and Blitzen must be on vacation because Santa Claus was spotted in Croatia on a paddleboard instead of reindeer. Dressed in the classic red and white, this group of 15 paddleboarders were in the charitable spirit this week, putting their Santa costumes over wetsuits and paddling out into the frigid waters. And all for a good cause. They were raising money for elderly citizens of Croatia's Istria region and having some fun while doing it. Cold just looking at them. Are you one of the millions of Americans worried your last minute gift may not make it under the tree in time? Well, Becky Worley has some 11th hour tips that could optimize your chances of delivery success. From online warehouses to package hubs to the last mile of delivery, the shipping system strained to the breaking point. Analyst Ship Matrix estimates that 7 million packages have been delayed this holiday season. The Washington Post reporting private carriers FedEx and UPS have cut off new deliveries for some retailers, rerouting surging mail volumes through the overwhelmed postal service. Now the U.S. Postal Service is seeing numbers like never before. With packages still en route and Christmas two days away, what should consumers do about their gifts? If you haven't gotten your gift yet, it might be time to get creative about your gifting options. There are some options for improving your odds of receiving that delayed delivery. Many carriers will let you sign up for real-time updates via text, but with this much volume, tracking software can be a little off. In fact, tracking isn't necessarily being updated in real time. I have several packages that say they're outstanding that have already been delivered. So it is possible that you'll get a nice surprise on your doorstep. Also, go to the carrier's website and make sure you don't have signature required for your deliveries. If you're unsure whether your package will deliver on time, you might need to be creative about how you deliver that gift. So you can wrap a smaller version of the item that you have coming to you or a picture of that item and still give somebody the opportunity to open that present 
without actually having the item in hand. I know some people out there who are probably taking notes. Our thanks to Becky for that. And before we go tonight, the image of the day. People lighting candles inside the Church of the Nativity in the West Bank ahead of Christmas Eve. This is believed to be the birthplace of Jesus Christ. That's our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Ariel Reshef in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Wishing you a safe and happy holiday. Happy holidays.